this presentation to go online with uh, share the screen in Teams. We are capturing the screen to send it to YouTube. I mean, I'm not your person to do that. Oh, Kenzie, can you come here? Can you? No point. Presentation to go online. We need to. Sharing your screen. Well, you can... But you have to tell him that, right? Because no. we're not doing anything with you. You're doing the presentation here, right? No, I, I, we don't have slides. It's not a. It's just, just one kind of slide. Yeah. This, that's what I'm saying. You just need to show it and then that's it. And so from this to... computer? Yes. Okay, so he can do that, right? Because we're not IT. We... Okay. So I think uh, this is what you need to do. Yeah. Join the team meeting, mm -hmm. share the screen if they have a presentation, and then that's what you okay. get. But it doesn't need to be shared also. It's just one title slide. If all they just pop it up? Yeah. It has to go to YouTube. Anything that needs to go to YouTube? No. I mean, like, they're streaming live. Yeah, but the slide, the slide could just be right up here. It doesn't have to go to the stream. No. Okay, then you're ready. Well, Danny, nothing will go to the stream. There, there is nothing projected. There's no projector over there, no but they're going to have you on. Yeah. Oh, gosh. It's only on these TVs. Yeah. TV screens. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Not you, I was talking to some USB sticks for you, yeah? Okay. So that you can transfer the files. For me, right? Yeah. Do you want to just go another thing? Thank you. And tomorrow yeah. you can give me another one. Um, I think we're just going to start without it. Yeah, after five minutes. Thank you. Well, we don't have to five minutes because it's been 15, I think, or 10. It's been 10. So I think we'll just start without the slides. Is it possible to have the screens go dark? Oh, what's up? Number 16? No, no, he's gonna open it. Just... Okay. Let's start the presentation. So, yeah, this is the ready. Is it? Yes. That's the ready. Okay. Okay. Two parts. 
And now they'll be about 35 minutes each. I'm sorry to cut them short, but we're getting started late. And it will, each of these panels will look at the ways the public and private sector can address these risks through interventions like True Costa County, sustainable food pledges, and, and pricing. So we're going to go ahead and get started on those, those three topics I just mentioned with our first panel. Buckle up, everyone. We have some great speakers. Um, so this, again, this, this first panel will focus on valuing food and agriculture systems. And to explore this topic, I have some great speakers. First, we have Zatuni Old Dada, the Deputy Director in uh, the Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity, and uh, the Environment at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. I want to commend him for his leadership at this COP for bringing food and agriculture systems to the table. You deserve a round of applause, sir. Thank you. We're also joined by Jeroen Remmers, the director of the True Animal Protein Price Coalition. Round of applause for Jeroen, please. We have Roy Steiner, the senior vice president for the Food Initiative of the Rockefeller Foundation. Nice to see you, Roy. And we have Helena Wright, the policy director for the Jeremy Collar Foundation. Nice to see you, Helena. And we're joined by Marco, the CEO of the Capitals Coalition. So I want to thank you all so much for being here, and I just want to dive right in since we have such little time. If we could close the back door there a little bit, Bernie. Okay, maybe not. Um, so Zatuni, if I can start with you. I, I want to know how the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations looks at this issue of, of true cost accounting in our food systems. What are your thoughts? I know it's an issue that you've taken on over the last several years. Okay, so thank you very much and good afternoon everyone. Um, well, first of all, we are really pleased now that the agri food systems in general are getting the attention we deserve. Now we're talking more about food and agriculture as what they have to offer in terms of solutions to, to the succession of the crises that we're, we're facing. So this is our new narrative basically that we turn away from talk, talking more about um, agriculture as being res responsible for um, you know, greenhouse gas emissions and biodiversity loss and others into what, what we need to do about it. Mm -hmm. so we know all the facts, we've been talking about them for a while and uh, the facts obviously are, are worrying, that's why we, we don't just to, want to keep quoting the figures and, and talk about that, but what do we need to do about it? And I think we all talk about the transformation that we need to make because the current model is no longer fit for purpose. You know, we've been producing food for the sake of producing food, but at what cost? It's costing us um, a lot in terms of decline of um, quality of soil, uh, biodiversity, and also our health. You know, we're not really producing to nourish unfortunately. So back to the, the, the theme here, valuing, I don't think we value food enough, I don't think we value the soil enough, I don't think we value even the ecosystems in general enough. Um, if you look just at the investment that's being made, um, just the climate finance for instance, just about 3 or 4 percent goes to agriculture. And yet, you know, all the SDGs um, we know they are about um, environmental, economical and social dimensions. The environmental dimension is neglected in, in a sense. So valuing is so critical because we keep throw food away, uh, throwing food away, and that means we don't value things. We don't really respect where it's coming from, and yet we take it for granted because it's available to us as a big choice. Um, we can choose almost any food we want in certain parts of the world that is available to us. So my final point in terms of valuing is we really have to change our mindset first and how we view food. What does food mean to us? And we really have to take it seriously, all of us. It's not just policy makers or investors. It's us, consumers, people, citizens. Absolutely. So I'll finish with that. Thank, Thank you. you for tuning in. I love that idea about citizen eaters taking action on this, but you also brought up some other critical points around changing our mindsets around not blaming farmers and agriculture for these problems, but looking at agriculture as the solution. So Mark, 
I'm hoping I can turn to you now and, and sort of build on what Zatini said about valuing and respecting our food systems in a different way and making sure that, you know, with, with that change in mindset, there comes action and, and new policy. Completely. Hello. So my name's Mark Roth. I'm the Chief Executive of the Capitals Coalition. Um, we've been rolling out through the EU-funded uh, UN projects in seven countries, so India, Brazil, Mexico, China, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, with about 600 business operational guidance to actually help them start to turn this work into practice. That's been great. We've been doing that over the last three years. In fact, I've got a team from India at the moment running workshops today, actually helping to bring some of that work together and really trying to connect up the policy makers with the actual businesses that are doing work with the farms on the ground. And that's the great thing about the food system, it does bring these systems together. Now, what we're now doing with that is that's been the basis for us to come out with an integrated protocol that will be coming out at the end of this year, looking across all of those different areas. And that's supported by the true price and the economic impact of foundation. All of those other methodological producers are supporting this overarching framework to actually help those businesses. There's one more thing I just want to add into this. We've got, uh, from COP27 where we are today, we've obviously got another COP coming up in a couple of weeks' time in Montreal. In that, target 15 of that work is to make mandatory assessment and disclosure of impacts and dependencies. That's the bedrock of what we're talking about here on the valuation. If that goes through, it's still in brackets at the moment. I've spent the morning talking to negotiators. There's still a few countries that are putting up blocks. Several who have just changed their government, maybe in like the UK. But we're going to get there, we're going to try and change some of those things. But if that goes through, then what we're talking about here becomes mandatory for businesses. And that would be a real game changer in this place. It's in brackets, like I say, but I'm very hopeful. And we've got about 330 businesses that have signed up to support that. We've then got, um, and we opened up our delegation. We've actually got now 700 businesses applied to come with our delegation to go to Montreal to ask for regulation. So when businesses are starting to be asking for regulation in this space, it's really important. Absolutely. I, I, Mark, it makes me wonder what kind of businesses are these? Are these the usual suspects, who, you know, the small and medium-sized businesses that have mission-driven sort of uh, uh, mindsets from the beginning, or any of the big players involved? There's a lot of big players as well. The interesting thing with value is that um, we would normally expect the human leaders and all of that, they're always there. We're being approached now, particularly over the last couple of years since COVID, by businesses that would never be in that sustainability fund. They're not going to report about it yet, but actually they're really interested to understand how this can help their business. So it's in the boardroom, it's being discussed about, and that I think is fascinating. Absolutely. There's companies that I would not, and I can't tell you some of the names, but that really Please, would no. not normally be at these sort of events are coming to us because they know that they've got to address this problem and they're trying to find the right way of doing it. And great. That is a great way to help. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. Roy, if I can turn to you, you know, the, the Rockefeller Foundation has invested a lot in the idea of true cost accounting and making sure it's implemented on the ground in different ways. And I'm wondering if you can give us some examples of where you see true cost accounting really working. Sure. Um, so first, I just want to congratulate the FAO in choosing true cost accounting as their uh, the state of food and agriculture for 2023. So that's something that was really relatively niche, you know, five to ten years ago is now going to become mainstream. And I think uh, also other like the Food Economic Commission, uh, System Economic Commission that EAT is doing. I mean, it's really this is an issue that I think is really starting to capture. Um, the attention of, of, of policymakers. Um, we started this a few years ago by looking at the U.S. system because we were there, and it's with McKinsey and, and company, and, and show that you know U.S. creates um, um, a trillion dollars worth of economic value for the food system, but conservatively, costs creates two trillion dollars worth of um, costs. So essentially, like, and this is similar to the rest of the world, we've created a value-destroying food system. And who wants to be part of a value-destroying system? We, we, this food system can actually create incredible amounts of value, but it's going to change, it, it really has to change a whole bunch of policies at different levels. So, for example, uh, we're working with New York State uh, to change the lease bylaw. They have to 
they buy about two billion dollars worth of food. By law, they have to get the lowest cost provider. That means if Washington State our apples are one cent cheaper than uh, New York State apples, they have to buy Washington or Chinese apples. Which makes no sense if you look at the overall cost associated with that particular apple. Some of the more interesting work we've recently done is with the uh, India's public distribution service. It's the largest purchaser of food in the world, 800 million people. And uh, it costs the Indian government about $14 billion. Uh, our recent analysis with the Tata Cornell Institute show that conservatively, it got, it, there's an extra $6 billion worth of associated environmental and, and water use costs. And, um, and, and simply by changing the way they procure, both the diversity of the crops as well as they can actually reduce that dramatically and, and create literally billions of dollars of value by changing some of the procurement uh, rules. So there, it's not like uh, always you have to increase the cost of food. Sometimes it's changing the way uh, the procurement rules are, are done to, to really shift the, shift the system. Um, I think I'm up there. That, yeah, we'll come back to some of it. I think that power of procurement piece is really important. So, Helena, that makes me want to turn to you and sort of talk about, you know, what other challenges are, uh, you know, the current way of doing things, business as usual, including agricultural subsidies. Uh, they, they present a lot of challenges when we're trying to implement true cost accounting. I wonder if you could talk a little about that. Thanks, Sunny. Yeah, so I'm Helen Rice, I'm the policy director at the Jeremy Collar Foundation, also work uh, with the Fair Initiative, which I'll find on that Jeremy can talk about later on. Um, I'd just like to touch on agricultural subsidies in particular. You know, according to the UN, there's more than 500 billion in harm to agricultural subsidies, and that is actually uh, incentivizing unsustainable consumption and production. Um, and Effectively, that is acting as a negative carbon price, um, and that term of negative carbon price is actually coined by Nick Stern, some of you may know Lord Stern's work. Um, instead of actually having a carbon price on food, we actually have a negative carbon price caused by the harmful agricultural subsidies. And that's also obviously a big topic under the Biodiversity Summit, uh, which has Target 18, that's supposed to be about reforming agricultural subsidies. So what we're doing is we're actually destroying the planet and repaying it paying for it ourselves um, and that's, this also has material risk for investors so the FAIR initiative which is funded by the Polar Foundation works with um, investors with 69 trillion in assets under management and those investors have started to recognise all the material risks associated with the current system that we have now such as climate risk, biodiversity risk, the overuse of antibiotics which is a huge silent pandemic for the world and also working conditions and other risks as well. So we actually need these harmful subsidies to be repurposed in line with climate and with nature, which is something that also institutional investors have been calling for. And we just reached, released a report actually on the just transition with, for agriculture. So that could be encouraged by reforming agricultural subsidies. Um, and through that, we also need to work with finance ministries. So a final point, there's a really critical role for finance ministries in understanding what are the costs of their current policy. They might be funding with agricultural subsidies something that is actually causing harmful climate impact, health impact and nature impact across the rest of the economy. So that could be a really critical lever in actually supporting the transition to a more sustainable food system. And finally, I'd just like to congratulate the FAO as well for talking earlier this week about the need for a clearer roadmap to 2050 and that will help guide um, the policies that we need to see and the investors and finance and also the targets that we need to see for the food system. Thank you, Thank you so much, Helena. All really interesting points, which makes me want to turn to Jeroen because Helena brought up, you know, in the current system we're incentivizing unsustainable production. And you have looked at, at really closely at fiscal incentives to help address these challenges that we're discussing. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about those different tax models uh, that the TAP Coalition has analyzed and what they would look like and, and what they would, you know, what they would make our food system taste like. Thanks uh, very much. Yes, as a, a TAP Coalition, we are the true animal protein price coalition. So what we do is uh, making true price calculations for uh, meat and dairy and egg products. 
So including external costs uh, like greenhouse gas emissions and nitrogen pollution, uh, particulate matter by the first loss. And uh, in this report, the called the sustainability charge on meat, we made calculations for the prices of uh, beef, uh, pork, and um, chicken meat at the EU level. So if we could include all those external costs into real uh, food prices at supermarket level, um, this means uh, beef products, for instance, would be nearly five euros per kilogram more expensive. For pork, it's less, it's uh, three and a half euros more or less, and for chicken meat, 1.7 euros per kilogram. But if we also would include healthcare costs per kilogram meat, it, it would be higher. We said uh, food prices actually are two times higher than we pay in the supermarket. So, uh, what we ask uh, countries to do is to um, to apply the polluter pays principle uh, at food products and for, for, for agriculture. 50 years ago, uh, OECD countries signed for uh, the uh, polluter pays principle as the guiding principle for environmental policies. 50 years ago, but nothing has happened since then when it comes to food and, and the food system. We did it for uh, CO2. I think nearly all countries now have CO2 tax uh, systems like EPS or other taxes on energy. So that's normal, but in the agriculture sector, we have to do the same and use those tax revenues to pay for uh, cheaper sustainable food products, uh, subsidize it or reduce uh, taxes on vegetables and fruits and plant-based meat, and also at the same time use those tax revenues to pay farmers to make the shift towards sustainable farming methods. And in this way, we found that according to consumer service in Europe, um, uh, a majority of consumers support this kind of tax reforms and subsidy reforms. Uh, but it's the problem that politicians don't have the courage to do it and to act what is really needed and what their own voters say they have to do. So uh, we are raising political support uh, for this uh, proposals in, in the Netherlands, for instance, where the government is now studying how to implement the tax on meat, using tax revenues to support farmers. In Germany, they are doing the same. New Zealand announced that their farmers have to pay a greenhouse gas emission tax in 2025. So there are some more and more countries doing it, but now we have to accelerate it. Uh, absolutely, the urgency is so great. Um, and uh, you know, this leads me to uh, I think another question that sort of puzzles me. And Roy mentioned this earlier that you know this is an issue that's been on the table for a long time, true cost accounting in our food systems. Um, the, the Global Alliance for the Future of Food has been a huge leader in this. Experts like Pavan Sukdev, Alexander Mueller, Kathleen Merrigan, and many others have been pushing for this for more than a decade. Um, and, and I wonder, you know, now that we're finally getting some traction, which is great because of all of you and others in this room, how do we communicate this effectively to eaters, those citizen eaters that, that Zatuni talked about? And Zatuni, I'm going to talk to you. This is a this is a difficult issue for some reason, often for consumers to sort of understand because they feel like they're they have to pay more. They don't understand. They're only thinking about what they they are going to lose rather than what they're going to get. And I'm wondering if you can sort of speak to that. Yes, thank you. Um, there are definitely a lot of messaging that we need to do in a simple way. I think just to be realistic about things and talk about them in simple terms. Everyone understands food, everyone knows the, how dependent obviously we are on, on food and especially in the current crisis, particularly the, those countries and communities who really notice the difference in the situation we're in. So I think the communication, in, in, in a general sense, we haven't been really good at that. Sure. We're very good at making communication to be the expert, the policy makers, you know, you see the summary of the policy makers. Right. You rarely see, well, what does it mean to, to people? You know, you meet someone at a dinner or barbecue or something and they ask you, you know, what do you do for a living? And you want to explain to them what climate change is and what do we need to do? and why the world is completely different now and it will continue to be different unless we wake up and do something about it. So on your point of communication, I think we just need to go down to common sense and make sure we make a lot of effort in explaining things that people can actually 
connect with and I'll give you I'll give you a practical example. And I'm from Morocco, when I go back to Morocco and sit down with, with someone, you go to the markets, yeah, and you speak to someone who's selling fruits and vegetables and and you try to talk to them about it, what they're worried about. You don't know anything about climate change. If you present it to them in that way, it doesn't mean anything to them. And, um, and there is one cartoon that I like to always use in my presentations where uh, someone comes in with a laptop and you know, fancy tools and apps and the poor farmer looking at the crops that are dying and he says, I don't need an app, I need a solution. <laughs> so, and, and my final point, I think we also need to really go down to kids at school and start to really the education from now. Um, in many other areas, actually, that model worked when you think the long term and you invest in the future population from now. It happens a lot in sport. It gives a lot of results. And for climate change, food security, we need to start you know, teaching kids from now. Um, if you look at the um, the high middle income countries, I think it's only about 18% in the education curriculum that actually includes money to shopping. Um, and even, I don't know, here now we have youth involved in climate change, uh, which is another topic, but I think there needs a lot of help there so that actually young people understand what is actually expected from them. Absolutely. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Zatuni. Mark, you had some comments. Yes, we found um, again and again that true costing is great if you're talking to the middle class or true pricing. But actually, when we start engaging in other areas around the world, all they hear when you say about a true price or a true cost is that some people will have it and some people won't. The rich will be able to have it and I won't be able to have what I want which is where the whole idea of true value as an overarching term that brings us together, the value of the food is actually the conversation we've been having with people. That's where, in most places in the world, that's what they want to know, the value that they're getting from it. The cost and the price is a mechanism we can talk about in our technical processes and things like that in some audiences, but we must be using the value phrase, not the price and the cost. So interesting that semantics makes such a difference on this issue. Roy, I know this is something you've thought about too, sort of, you know, how you talk about this and how you talk about it to farmers and others. So we actually focus primarily on policymakers because they're the ones at the end of the day who, who actually have to bear the costs. And, you know, when we released this uh, report with, with McKinsey, we had four uh, government offices approach us because they could see the decisions they make, they end up having to pay for. I think the consumer is at a different space and you have to have a whole other communication. But for the governments who are like bearing the costs, they, they have to remediate the water, they have to uh, pay for the healthcare costs, they have, that it makes a lot of sense. It's like you can actually create billions of dollars of value um, uh, by, sh by shifting the way you do things. For example, in the US, we've just helped implement a food as medicine uh, project President Biden just announced it at the recent White House conference, um, and, and it's essentially allowing doctors to prescribe fruits and vegetables and have the health insurance company pay for it. It turns out you save a lot of money because who knew food is a lot cheaper than pharmaceuticals, uh, and 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 health insurance companies can make a lot of money, and so you you can by just create all this value by changing the way the decisions are thought about and and and, um, and made. So, I'll stop there. Thank you. I do want to come back to the idea of communicating this to farmers, and I'm not sure who on the panel would like to address that. But, Jeroen, please. We also have some farmer organizations amongst our partners because they like the idea that if two price on meat and dairy is really paid, part of this revenue is going to them. And they can work more sustainable and get some more people for money. So that is also what you can communicate and be found in consumer service if you tell um, why this higher prices are needed for the farmers, then they support them. Even uh, right-wing political parties and voters would support it. Other ways to communicate it would be 
to have two price tables in the supermarkets. There's one supermarket in, in Berlin who already show, shows it. Uh, that's uh, some price of food products have to be more expensive if, if you create a true price, including environmental cost. We also need mass communication, TV programs, explaining the benefits of the food price and food products. And um, so that people can use to it. And we have to tell them that, yes, food will become more expensive, but for the low income groups, we have to make special arrangements that they still can afford to buy uh, to buy food. And if, if it becomes too expensive for them, then governments should subsidize uh, or, or pay, uh, pay them um, compensations, uh, especially for the low income groups, and make schemes and maybe food vouchers to, so they can buy uh, sustainable food for free, like uh, implemented in France and Belgium, and which is now very uh, a hot topic because of very high food prices. I think this will be the future more and more that we need um, food prices will go up because it's inevitably, but we have to make sure that uh, food is a, is a human right and everybody can afford it. So we have to pay them and not say, well, we, sh we will not tax meat because then it will only be for the rich. But if you compensate low income groups, then they still can buy meat. That's our idea. So also to do this way. Sure, Jerome, quickly before I turn back to Helena, you mentioned earlier that uh, consumers or eaters, when they take surveys, are very in, in favor of, of you know what you're you're proposing, whether it's taxes on meat or true cost accounting or true value whatever we want to call it. But when consumers go to the grocery store, they act very differently than how they respond on surveys. And I wonder what, you know, how you can speak to that. Well, um, of, of course, when it's, when it's voluntary and you ask the people, somebody to, to pay for instance organic chicken meat, which is two times higher than normal chicken meat, then only a few people will do so. But if it's mandatory, everybody has to pay a higher price for this chicken product, then Everybody says, okay, this is fair, and everybody wants to pay the same price. Um, and yeah, we found in consumer service in, in France, Germany, and Netherlands that if you say, would you have a zero fat rate on healthy products like vegetables and fruits, and a high fat rate on meat and dairy, then 70% of consumers say yes. And this was also reflected in the European Parliament, where there was a vote about the amendment of the farm to fork strategy that the European deal for food. At a really large majority, even uh, with the right wing uh, political parties like the Christian Democrats and the Liberals, they voted for it. And now this is being implemented at the EU level. It started with a uh, uh, zero fat rate for vegetables and fruits. So it's now an option, so Germany and Netherlands are going to do it. But the high price for meat and dairy is still something to be discussed in, at the member state level. Sure. But, but the, the politicians, in the EU Parliament, they, they know this is the way forward. So now the politicians in the member states have to, to do the next step. Great, true. Thank you. Helena. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, just to add a couple of more points in terms of the actual uh, price of food and the value. I think it's important to talk more about the benefits of the transition to a sustainable food system as well. And for example, just to give one example, some research at Oxford University actually found that if we shift to flexitarian diet that would save actually health costs of 50 cents per person per day. That's a huge amount over the whole UK economy. It would be around 13 billion. So there's huge savings to be made on health by uh, shifting to a flexitarian diet. And also another couple of points is how our overuse and over-dependency on intensive animal agriculture actually pushes up food prices. We've seen that in the way that around 80% of soy, about 20% of corn um, goes to livestock, and that actually does push up food prices. Similar to the use of biofuels, there's that conflict there. So we can actually lower the price of staple foods for people and for fruits and vegetables by transforming the food system. And finally, just one more point. I think we also need to think about the price of alternatives for consumers. Um, just an example from, I think it's the Netherlands, where we saw the price parity between the uh, conventional meat burgers and plant-based burgers uh, now basically reaching price parity. So that's something where consumers will be able to make that sustainable choice uh, much more easily. Great, thank you. Mark, I, I'm wondering if you could 
wondering what your thoughts are on this like communication angle. I mean, you're talking to, to policymakers, you're talking to investors. You, you spoke to me earlier about how investors you know, want to change, but are they doing it quickly enough? So how can we encourage them? I mean, that's part of this communication strategy that I think we want to build around true cost economy or true value. Um, how do we how do we encourage them to understand the urgency of getting this done? Not you know by 2030, but today. I think one of the things, particularly in the investment space, I so I launched some work in 2017 in Hong Kong with HSBC. We had a 3,000 seater for the financial community to talk about valuation. 13 people turned up. Okay, no one was interested. That is now completely different. I can't get into the room at the finance event because there's so many people. But they're all coming up with their own ideas. So the problem with this at the moment is there's lots of momentum, but everyone wants to own it. I think I said the other day in a session of the way, it's like a toothbrush. Everyone wants a toothbrush, but you want your own one, you don't want to share it. And it's exactly the same with this. We've got everyone who's coming up with their own standard, their own approach. We've got to look at rid of some of those egos if we're going to accelerate this. This is why we need this make it mandatory thing to bring it in. We are then working with people like the Task Force for Next Related Financial Disclosures, now the Task Force for Social Related Financial Disclosures that we're setting up. We're setting up those as gateways in to allow all of these bits to connect. So actually from a user's perspective, you haven't got thousands of different programs and different pieces of work to do. You can actually just go in through one door and actually see how you do the assessment by coming to us. You do the commitments by going to the science-based targets. You do the transformation by working with others, and then you go to the disclosures through the International Sustainable Sands Bobs or the T, whatever, and these. Now that spells out Act D, which is a very nice acronym, to start bringing this together as an input. But we need to, I wouldn't say simplify, it's a complex space, and simplification means you lose something, we need to clarify. Absolutely. Clarify these bits to get people to step forward. I love that. Thank you so much for that. That clarification is key, I think, to all of this. And the nuance is there. And that's kind of how we started this conversation. And maybe, Virginia, if I can come back to you and then all of you can comment. You know, I mentioned earlier that True Cost Accounting and valuing food and agriculture systems looks at, you know, this in a very holistic way. And food and agriculture serve as this sort of perfect testing ground for, for True Cost Accounting. But I'm wondering if, if we can talk about the, you know, how we sort of bridge the gaps that are there. Not everyone's making the connection between food and agriculture and our climate systems until maybe this year at COP. You know, last year there was a lot of discussions. But how do we continue to, to, to narrow those gaps so people understand the importance of true cost accounting and all of these crises we're facing? We haven't even talked about the war against Ukraine by Russia. How can we make sure that true cost accounting is part of the the um, mechanism for solving these global shocks are helping us become more resilient to them. I think we have to start thinking more in systems, in the reality of the world, and not to look at things in isolation. Unfortunately, we still deal with things in silos more. So we talk about the strategy about water, strategy about agriculture, farming, etc. I think we need to to see how the world is interconnected so that our reasoning, our response is also interconnected. Um, and, and this is a, a good way of avoiding trade-offs because we don't want to fix one problem here without being aware that we're creating problems somewhere else. Uh, I'll give you an example. You know, we, we say okay, hunger is increasing around the world, there are around 800 to 8 million people who go hungry every day. So to feed everyone and to feed the growing population, let's increase production. But if we do that, just we focus on increasing production, of course, we're going to continue depleting the natural resources and depleting the water resources and soil, etc. So I think we have to start connecting more. And just add one final point, which is we're dealing with a very complex system. You know, food is not like energy or transport. It's a very complex system. Food means different things to many Absolutely. different people, different cultures. And that's what the complexity is. And I agree with Mark. I think that you know, we need to start clarifying things for ourselves so we'll be able to clarify it for others. And think about the reality. I love that. Thank you, Zucchini. Helena. Uh, it looks like you kind of agree with the point that I made already um, in terms of, you know, we really need to look at the trade-off between different systems. We can't 
can't sort of uh, deal with the water crisis, for example, by using up more water. I mean, you can actually think about the fundamental ecosystems that we rely on. Catch the vulnerability of agriculture is a huge focus for this crop as well. We also need to ensure the, the resilience of our ecosystems. Just to give one, NGFS actually released their biodiversity risk report and they, they found that the pollination services that we rely on, um, the overuse of pesticides, is valued at over 300 billion. So those services that we use that are free from beans, we cannot destroy those services through the overuse of pesticides. That's a critical issue. Thank you. Great example. Thank you. Roy. Sure. Um, yesterday I was on a wonderful panel with Jen Yates, um, and, uh, and there was a woman who from Egypt who gave a, a discussion and a presentation about what they're doing in terms of climate uh, carbon credits. And she talked about the economy of love, and I love. I, I think that's amazing uh, because actually what we're missing. You got to tie true cost of food to the economy of love. What we're really missing is the love of nature, the love of future generations, the love of humanity. That is ultimately at the very core of how we're going to create transformation. And and so if we can figure out how to connect love with the cost of we've got it made. Thank you. Jerome. Thank you. Um, yes, my, my point would be we are now in the climate summit. And one of the big problems is uh, the need is very consumption is really uh, growing fast. And in the last 20 years, it's grown it's, uh, nearly 60%. And um, so uh, the share of greenhouse gas emissions from meat and dairy is also growing. Now it's over 20%, and it's going up to 50%. Um, all greenhouse gas emissions in the world because the food uh, consumption of meat and dairy is increasing. So we really have to do something about it and we cannot ignore it anymore. And I, I would argue that tax would be the best way to, to get it down, at least in high income countries. And this is actually what the last IPPC report also asked to do. They said the consumer uh, consumption patterns have to change, otherwise, we will never realize the Paris climate in the world. So food pricing of food products is really the key to realize the 1.5 or even the 2 degrees Celsius of course. Um, and this was also reflected in, in the, the food security high-level uh, roundtable, which was held last Monday there the Egyptian president is asked uh, high income countries in their guiding questions, reduce your meat consumption, otherwise we will not realize the climate change. That was my takeaway. Thank you, Drew. Mark off, you get the last word. So one of the biggest barriers to us all being able to value food better is that uh, you have to times the use of something by a number to get to the impact of the dependency. Those value factors that you times it by, you have to go and buy those normally from someone like PwC or S&P or the World Bank has them or German government has them. All of them are different. So what I've been doing over the last year is I've got all of those people that hold those value factors together. They've agreed to give them to me for free. I'm going to be setting up at the moment, we've just set up a commission to do this. That commission is going to make all of those factors available to everyone around the world on an equitable basis for free. These factors so anyone can convert a use into an impact or a dependency. The key to this is the rules around how we do it. Because each one is set up in a separate way. So what we're doing is we're now creating those global criteria for how you create and use those factors so anyone, a small business, a small farmer, a government, a financial institution, will be able to have a consistent way of understanding what the value is. So instead of just working with true price one day, S&P the next, PwC the next day, getting different results, we can do that. That will be coming out next year. That is going to change what we're talking about here. Thank you so much, Mark. For, uh, I want to thank all of our panelists, but before you clap, I want them, I want everyone in this room to stay here. We have a second part of this this uh, event coming up, but I do want to go back to Roy's point that we need more loving and caring economies that care about our food systems, our farmers, our eaters, and and animals, and, and everyone involved. So thank you all so much. Please give this panel a round of applause. Nobody go anywhere, just the panel. And if our second group of panelists can come up, including uh, 
Jeremy Collar, Glen Hill Storlin, Earthring Cousin, and Fairy, please come to the stage. Just giving our panelists a few minutes to get settled. Thanks all for staying in the room. We've, we've only lost a few. Makes me happy. Wonderful. So I have the pleasure of joining uh, for our second conversation uh, focused on the way forward a climate friendly future food. Joining me is uh, Jeremy Collar, the chairman for Collar Capital. Round of applause for Jeremy, please. We have Ben Hill Sperdlin, the founder and executive chair at the E Forum. Uh, we have Earthring Cousin, who I'm glad can make it, the founder and CEO of Food Systems for the Future. And we're also joined by Barry Martin, a member of the managing board at Bravo Bank. So delighted to meet you, Barry. Thank you for being here. So uh, again, thank you. Round of applause for Barry. I, I, we only have you know a short time left, so I want to make sure that we get to um, questions for both the first and second panel after this uh, after this panel concludes. But Earthrun and Goodhold, I, I want to start with you too. You're both very powerful people who have inspired me over the years, and I, I wonder when we think about what a climate friendly future of food looks like, what does that look like from each of your perspectives? And maybe Earthrun, I'll start with you. Okay, there we go. A climate-friendly food system. You know, last year when we had the UN Food System Summit, we all walked out of there. We agreed that a food system, a sustainable, just food system, would be a food system that protects our environment our human health, as well as providing the financial return to all actors across the food system, an equitable financial return, including the farmers. And as someone said yesterday, we will not succeed if we continue to see farmers as beneficiaries and not as business people, and that farmers don't continue to make the, the return that is necessary to them to become more than subsistence farmers. And, but it also means that we are providing the support that we need through our food system for the access to affordable, nutritious food for all. When we talk about return, we need to include eaters into what is a, 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 a sustainable and just food system in our region. Because if we do the things that are necessary, but those who are, particularly those who are most vulnerable, cannot afford access to nutritious food, then we will fail. Absolutely. Thank you, Arthur. Good note. Thank you so much, uh, Danny. And I agree with everything that Arthur said. But I also just want to reinforce that when we are talking about a climate to say food future, we are talking about food systems going from one third of the emissions to becoming net carbon things by 2050 and onwards. Something that is in all the IPCC models, um, getting down towards 1.5, and no single country in the world has a plan for how to do that, while building resilience, while doing this socially just, and ensuring access to healthy and nutritious food for a growing population. And I just want to stress that please let all of us be very vocal about getting food systems into the outcome documents of this COP. Because right now we are in danger of getting food security into the language, and that might take another four years to actually get back. So, over to you. 
you, thank you. Gunhild, I want to stay with you for a minute. You know, Earthrun referred to the UNFSS, the UN Food System Summit, and, you know, a lot of coalition building came out of that. And, uh, you know, what I know has been important to you personally and to EAT is, is really reaching these science-based targets, and the Lancet 2.0 report is a part of that. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little to that before we turn to, to Barry and Jeremy. Thanks for reminding me about actually the most important point <laughs> was to make in this introduction. Um, part of the, the gaps that were left after the UN Food Citizen Summit was that we are still we still don't agree on where we are heading. We don't have a set of 1.5 degree equivalent for food systems, which is absolutely essential for the world to rally behind, like we have seen on 1.5. So since the UN is not doing it, it has to happen. Uh, EAT, together with the Lancet, are setting up a new commission, EAT Lancet 2.0, where we have brought in uh, the best scientists across different disciplines, uh, really about meeting the criticism of the first report, uh, updating and scrutinizing the existing targets, expanding it to cover new knowledge gaps, and including social justice for the first time, and a very strong focus on national translation, which was one of the appropriate criticisms from the first report. You can't talk about one global framework. So, strengthening the modeling and building really the first food into, into comparison model. Um, it's underway, it will be announced and published in end of 2024 or early 2025. But as each, we are not waiting until the report is out because it's urgent, urgently needed to get all stakeholders to start acting on the framework. Thank you, and thank you for referring to urgency again. We can't wait for, as much as I'm looking forward to the Lancet report, we can't wait for it. We need to make action now. So, so Barry, uh, you know, the, the last panel talked a lot about investment and finance and what needs to change, and the Good Foods Finance Network has noted that change, actual real change, requires catalytic breakthroughs. In, in food finance, and I'm wondering from your perspective at Bravo Bank, what does that, that catalytic, catalytic breakthrough actually look like? What are we talking about? So I used to, <laughs> again? Okay. So thank you. Look, I, I think that the first thing is that we have to realize that yes, the food systems can be positive, net positive, what you were referring to. And then you have to break down where you have to go to. So if you look at where you have to invest to get net positive, uh, I think we, we don't have a clear view on how and where we are going to give them. So what we have done at Rabobank, we have asked our young people to go in each of the buckets of intervention and see how could you come with ideas that would really change that bucket. Right, so is it the bucket of consumption? Is it the bucket of production? Is it the bucket of food waste? Is it the bucket of um, uh, soil sequestration? Or is it the bucket of reforestation of forestation? You can go through all those buckets and say, okay, if I would like to, uh, to reach the full potential, which I see saying that each of these buckets can, you have to look at it. So one of the examples that we have done, we came with, uh, with the idea of the reforestation for small farmers. So our group came, we called it the ACORN project, and what we, our people said, okay, could we use technology and digitalization to come with an idea to pay for the, to the small the farmer for the environmental services? Because if they do that, they are going to plant more trees. Mm -hmm. If they plant more trees, they will, we actually attack that, that part of reforestation. So that's done. We're already issuing uh, carbon credits uh, to and uh, financial institutions and multinationals buying those uh, credits at more than $30 a ton. So what is that? Basically, every year we, we make a measure. You have biomass and smaller farm on your farm. What is the delta growth of all the trees you have on your farm? And that delta we pay. We pay, we can increase the cash flows, but that's what's important. The cash flows of every smaller farm are almost $200 or, uh, per, per hectare, just because paying for the environmental services. And you can take that same thing and prospect it to uh, the whole, uh, uh, what well, we call it, rhythm that farm and soil health, but actually the sequestration of carbon in the ground. We need to get to four gigatons to do that. And the only way we are going to do it is to have clear cash flows and pay to the farmers to do that. Help them to the 
now we are looking how can we help the farmers through the transformation, right? You have a period of five to seven years to transform, and how can we get public-private partnerships so that we can help most farmers in the world to do that? Those, together, if we can get it done, they represent, by IPCC on average, eight gigatons of reduction. If you think about that, the total is 15 gigatons. I think we're talking about a major thing. So we are up to, to something. You are up to something for sure. Thank you so much. And I want, to get, I want to get back to that, how we can create a just transition question in, in a few minutes. But um, Jeremy, if I can turn to you, we heard from Jerome on the last panel who, subject, uh, who talked about taxes on the animal protein. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can build on what Helena from your team talked about on, on really reforming our, our agricultural subsidies and how what that actually looks like. Yeah, well, first of all, first of all, can I just say that I am a chief investment officer, but I'm here today representing Fair Chair. It's it's the fastest growing ESG network in the world, 59 trillion dollars, and and we're seeing a, a manifestation of investment risks. You know, we can worry about people, but the planet and the climate. But we're looking through a lens of investment risk. We, we represent, uh, you know, global pension plans which are billions of uh, retirements, and and that capital not only pays pensions but actually owns and drives the direction of corporates or businesses. And they increasingly see material risks for companies that fail to address the transition to a more sustainable food system. So we, we've seen, uh, for instance, California ban the everyday use of antibiotics, that's an investment risk. We've seen New Zealand, uh, as was discussed, with carbon levies, that's an investment risk. And Hallmark Westland, through uh, social interaction, many company, dairy companies going into Chapter 11 because of investment risks. And, um, that's why FAIR is very proud about the good food finance. But at FAIR, uh, we've got a climate risk tool that, that is looking at and analyzing uh, the climate risk for investors. And it shows that to mitigate the change on meat production, we can have more efficient farming practice, but we can also substitute meat with alternative proteins. And, um, and sustainable proteins can be a, a, a potential hit. So climate risks don't only hit the alternative protein sector uh, nearly as hard as the meat equivalent, but they can provide value for protection against financial and operational risks. And so what we're asking for in a way is that, um, you know, as discussed, we're spending a half a trillion a year on subsidies for anachronistic ag agricultural industry which was fit for purpose 50 years ago but today we need um, a roadmap for a just transition for farmers every industry transforms itself as new technology develops why should food and farming be any different why would you choose to inefficiently get milk from a cow when you can make exactly the same milk from a brewery? Why would you choose to feed six calories to an animal to, to produce one calorie of meat with all the water used, land and waste issues that come with it when you can grow the same product in a lab? And this is a, a vision of the future that we can build on. But today, right now, we could start by making much better use of, for instance, uh, pea-based protein, for example, growing crops to feed people rather than livestock. And, um, you know, we need to change the way we think about farming and end the outdated subsidies for the well-intended, but the ultimately um, industrialization of, of agriculture that we've done. And factory farming is becoming a stranded asset. That history is making that going to make that inevitable. We just have to look at the number of massive dairy companies that have gone into bankruptcy in the U.S. And you know, livestock is no longer a cash cow. And so.
also, you know, as investors, we want to be involved in, and farmers do as well, want to be involved in successful and growing in industry. So, you know, we want to see all of us embrace sure. the transition. Great, great. And I'm glad you brought up this idea of a just transition. I think Barry referred to it before, but Earthburn, I want to go to you and then maybe to Barry. What does a just transition for farmers and eaters and businesses look like when you would combine all three of them? It's very difficult because it's going to look very different for all three of those. Not only will it look very different for all three of them, it will look very different in different parts of the world. Um, the, too often we sit in conferences like this one and we talk about what is necessary and what we should or should not do and should or should not consume and how our food systems will transition. We're, as if we only have one food system. Right. We have, a, a, our food systems are local and when we talk about what a just transition looks like, it will look like, it will look differently based upon the local food system. And so if we recognize that, that we are providing for whether we're talking grow crops or sustainable livestock production, we are talking about the, the transport from farm gate to consumer and what, how consumers um, how consumers eat and how we dispose of food. You know, much of the time when we talk about transition of the food waste and addressing the issues of food loss and waste, we fail to recognize that food loss and waste is very different in the United States versus where the food, uh, food waste um, is one thing in Chicago and something completely different in Senegal. It is much more about food loss because of lack of access to warehousing and refrigeration and the logistic support that is necessary to support the appropriate transformation of that food system. So to, to try and define specifically what it means when we know that we have a zip food system, uh, I will simply say that what it will require is a whole of society transformation and support from too often we look at what are the policies that are necessary what are the government interventions that are required without looking at what are the investments that are required from the private sector how do we build the businesses that will support a functioning food system and scale them up in a way that they provide the support that is necessary for consumers to have access to the food that they need and we fail to to draw the relationship between consumption and farmers at every level because what farmers will tell you, whether it's in Iowa or Nairobi, is that they will grow what consumers will buy. Absolutely. And so our, as, as we sit in, in conversations like this one, it's quite critical that we recognize that context will drop ultimately what adjusts what what will how we define just and sustainable Thank you so much, Earthburn. That was very powerful. Here, I want to go back to you. You talked about you know paying farmers for their stewardship, for their environmental services that they're providing, whether we pay them or not. And it's really changing this sort of the the um, how we view farmers, how we respect them. They are not just food producers, which is often ironically to me still looked down upon still across the world but they are business people business women and businessmen who are trying to make a living and they deserve to be paid that is part of this just transition absolutely look uh, we i have we at Bank have really to convince uh, the conviction that we need to create systems and structures that the cash flows flows into the farmers for those services i i, I think one of the things that we are we're completely missing as, uh, and in addition to what you said, let's completely agree that the systems are different for small, medium, and big farmers across the region, is that actually we should start paying the farmer for nutrition yes. and not for volume. So two things that have to completely change in the way we are looking at the world is that one, we have to pay for the, the ecological services the farmers are rendering to us because they are the ones, the stewards of the land, either under the land or above, and we also should think about it, we should pay for nutrition. The way the system is geared towards is actually volume. And if you look now, I'm going to the balance sheet of the banks, and I'm going to, because that's very important, 
if you look at the Net Zero Banking Alliance, what they are forcing us as a bank is actually to steer towards reduction of the total volume of finance emissions and not about the total volume of the future finance emissions. It's so crazy. So for me today, it's, easy, it's better as a bank okay, to find sugar, really, because that's the high volume with low emissions than actually go to a very nutritious food that could be canola or, or sorry, could be uh, any other of this uh, super uh, nutritious food because the volume is low and the value is high, so it really is a negative on my balance sheet. So I really, and we are talking about uh, the and the disclosures, etc. We actually should talk about nutrition disclosure. I love it. Sorry, nutrient disclosure. You actually deliver nutrients and I find the nutrients that are delivered because otherwise, you know, we're never going to feed everybody because at the end we only live, we only live from nutrition and not from volume. Thank you. Very great. I love you, my brother. But I disagree. I think nutrition is definitely part of what we need to do. We need new seeds and tools that provide a, a increased yields that are more nutritious. But we also need to recognize that our, we share the agricultural food system. The food system shares the agricultural production system, also with with fiber, sure. with feed, and with fuel. And as we talk about agricultural production, and what I would say is as opposed to yields per acre, we need to start talking about dollars per acre that, that farm produces. That, and that gets us into sequestration, it can get us into nutrition, it can also get us into productivity for fiber production because we will not win if we fail to recognize that our agricultural system is important to others in on this planet besides the eaters. Absolutely, absolutely. I love it when Earthrain gets fired up. Thank you, Earthrain. Good Hill, I have a question for you. So when I look at this panel, it's pretty homogeneous. We, we don't have a farmer. And I wonder if you, like me, are often put in a position for, of speaking for farmers when you're on panels like these. Uh, sorry, just, just, if I get a question, uh, what I would say on behalf of the farmers on this panel. I mean, first of all, I think we, we need the farmers at the table. Uh, <laughs> they shouldn't be spoken for. Uh, but over the past one and a half year, I've spent quite a lot of time with uh, visiting farmers, learning from them, understanding where the bottlenecks uh, are as they see it. And I think as long as farmers are confident that they will be at the center of this transformation and that their work, they're putting in so many hours, much more than most of you and us, if they are valued for their contribution to society and if we get the pricing of food correctly, so we have the value for the ecosystem services, for nutrition, for food security for the country, then we can actually, governments can actually afford paying farmers more, reducing healthcare costs, increasing national security. But this goes back to why we are here in this panel and why these guys are actually loving each other and we should be that we have started something called the digital finance network. Because today, investors, whether they are public or private or multilateral, they are still into the silos. TCFD, TNFD, disclosing that it's disclosing nutrition in another corner. This is never going to work. We need to have a true systems approach. We need to start talking about true value, true cost of food. And that has to be reflected even within investment decisions. And this Good Food Finance Network is so important to start waking that investor community up because they investment like Jeremy is referring to is not only the subsidy but the way that private investors are investing in the food space today it's shockingly misaligned with the imperative of improving the health of people and planet and building prosperity and socially justice uh, for for the future and I can take the that's great <laughs> the no, that's perfect step. yes please Jeremy just one thing which is give us a road map Give us the aligned millions of subsidies, and that will unlock trillions in private capital. We 
we just see the level playing field. Sure, sure, absolutely. Thank you for pointing that out. I do think that that's absolutely necessary. One of the things that I want to get back to, and I brought it up in the last panel, is the, the urgency. We're all here for a reason. We all flew to Egypt for a reason because we feel very strongly about making a difference on the climate crisis. But I don't feel the urgency from the investment community right now. And maybe because I'm not as deeply in it as you, but I, I'm fairly you know, educated on these issues. Why are we not seeing the sort of urgency from this community Cause that could potentially make such a big change? Give us a carbon tax and then you'll see an urgency. Do you agree, Arthur, in a carbon tax? I think a carbon tax is definitely and it is definitely part of it. But I also think it's about the investment community is looking for return and return in, in at, at a at a, at a at market level rate of better. And they are also looking at return in a in a particular time period. Agriculture has not particularly been a dark of the, the, either the VC, the right. public equity, or the, the commercial uh, investment community for that reason, sure. because of the significant amount of risk. And I think that one of the other, in addition to a, 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 the, a carbon tax or carbon credit, what is necessary is governments and, and philanthropy bringing concessionary capital to de-risk the investments in the food system that will allow for us to attract more private sector investment capital. Um, and once we begin to do that and then can deliver those returns in the at the appropriate level in, the appro in an adequate time frame, we will see more private sector capital moving into the, into the space. It, because the, cha the challenge is money follows success. And we have not demonstrated enough success, particularly in the places that need it most, for investment to scale. Thank you, Arthur. And very, what Arthur describes sounds great to me. It sounds awesome. But I am afraid that the world will be on fire by the time that all takes place. How can we get the, the, the investment and finance community to, to make these actions now? Well, look, there are small things and there are big things, right? So the small things also add up, right? So uh, I was talking about Acorn, which is already working, right? So things are already happening and that adds up. Uh, I'm talking about the carbon bank that's already working and it's adding up. Where we have a lot of issues is right now is the absolute uncertainty about what's really going to happen. And all those transformations, they take time, right? The big part of the transformation process is that if you want to transform your farm from a conventional farm, resident farm, it's 15, five and seven years to get there, right? To do everything. But one thing is for sure, it's absolutely uncertain how it's going to be looked like, the whole policy thing work, which how it's going to be looked like in seven years time. So I might might get the investments done. They are, they are, and if you look at, at some of the regulations coming out, we actually don't even have clarified who owns that carbon which is under the ground. Is it the value chain? Is it the farmer? Is it actually going to the national defined contribution? Actually, this is in many countries. New Zealand is going ahead to say, no, I'm going to change it out. They're going to charge you for the carbon. But they're not going to pay for the carbon that's in the ground. But they will pay for the carbon that's above the ground. And that, if I see the discussion somewhere else, like in the US, where they find actually investing in carbon in the ground. So it's a very difficult for us also as well than to understand uh, where should we deploy money? If we would like to grow the next 30 billion in assets, where are we going to do it? Because we actually don't know where the most beneficial env uh, environmental or uh, uh, legislation is going to be. So we're doing the small things right now, the no regret thing, which I was talking about. But I think what we should be pushing for the next COP28 is actually that we have clarity of where policy is going to. That would be my... Uh, Absolutely. Good help. Can I uh, thank you so much for serving up that goal? Because I think what we need to acknowledge is that this is about systems failure, and there is no single sector or constituency that can fix this alone. So we need to move in parallel. And we are running out of time. I mean, we should have done this yesterday. Uh, I think it's really dangerous to be too happy with incremental changes. What we need is now exponential, exponential changes. 
and there is a growing coalition of coalitions, different initiatives, many of you are here, are already involved, um, to work together for two major breakthroughs by COP28, uh, to get food systems into climate action. And the one is to get policy changes, to get national governments to commit at the highest level, to start the work of developing holistic food system strategies, that is, uh, 1, 1.5, SDG aligned, resilient, just, etc. And get cities to do the same, get uh, private sector partners, financiers within the same countries to match these commitments and then build tailored packages of support with science, with economic analysis, etc. to really list up these champion countries, ideally from different continents, that can start bending the curve and showing what good looks like. Because that's a problem today, we don't know what that what transformation actually looks like. And the second component, which is also an idea that has been spearheaded by the Good Good Finance Network, is the idea of a mechanism to ensure access to finance. Two countries, cities, small farmers, actors on the ground, and really a mechanism or a co-investment platform that allows for channeling public and private and multilateral and philanthropy finance through a mechanism that actually ensures that it benefits those who are part of the transformation and that are ready to commit. So if we work together by COP28, we could have these two massive commitments and a mechanism, a co-investment platform for finance up and running. And from then, I sprint to 2030. Are you ready, Barry? <laughs> That's what I'm really talking about. We need to have this framework. I'm really desperate for that. Because even even if you don't have those, even if we try to get concessionary financing in, yeah. it's uncertain because how are you going to deploy this finance if we actually the rules the games are not known? Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I do, <laughs> I do want to give a few moments for the audience to ask questions. We have time for about two questions. Right there. We're going to bring you a mic. We're going to bring it from up here, I think. Thank you, Kenzie. Round of applause for Kenzie. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's a great panel. Nick Robbins, uh, Professor of Sustainable Finance from the School of Economics. Yesterday, we launched a uh, guide, the Transition Finance Guide, for banks and investors with the ILO. As you know, the ILO is the keeper of the just transition principles, and it's really good to hear the focus on a place-based approach from the panelists. Um, I'd be really interested to know how questions of meaningful participation of stakeholders, uh, land workers, indigenous peoples, as well as farmers are going to be included, and what changes do you think land and ten land tenure we're going to need to ensure that actually we have a just transition? Many thanks. Great question. Which of you wants to take that on? Earth looks happy to do it. Yeah. When I was U.S. Ambassador for Food and Agriculture, we, uh, the entire global community came together at FAO to pass a land tenure reform that governments all agreed to. There's been very little action at the country level to implement. And the challenge is, you're absolutely right, unless we address the issues related to land tenure, many of the issues that we're talking about, whether we're talking carbon sequestration, access to additional capital for that fund, for, for the uh, uh, more regenerative production on that land, we're going to have little effect. And so that is a big factor that we need to continue to support as we move forward. And as you talk about this, one of the reasons I talk about place-based um, food systems, the, context, the con contextualizing food systems is specifically because we don't take into account the enough the learnings and the intelligence and the knowledge of indigenous people in our food system. As we talk about, yes, we must have new solutions that are that that include biology, digital, AI, uh, all of those will come, but we also need to recognize that there are many communities that are performing. What could be, what is, what can be defined as regenerative agriculture today that should be included in any food system uh, plan that a country puts forward for how they are going to meet their NDCs through the transformation of their food systems? 
Thank you so much, Arthur and Barry. No, I, I fully agree. And that's why I think the point of there is no one solution fits all. So the, I, I really have the, 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 the solution for a large farmer which has 100,000 hectares completely different than in the community in Africa. So we have decided in, the, in Rabobank to divide all those different types of regions and, and type of farmers into different clusters so that we can provide different solutions. So in the specific case of, of, of communities, we have now uh, deployed the Rabo Foundation. Today, we are uh, operating with more than 356, uh, uh, let's say, communities or cooperatives, small cooperatives, etc., reaching three and a half million smaller farmers. This approach is completely different than an approach if you go to a large farmer in, in the US or even to a medium-sized farm in Europe. So what we have been doing more and more is, is actually making a split in region and type of farmer that you can encounter. That's the only way of getting there because the needs are completely different. If you are in the community, your need is ecosystems. You need to provide the full ecosystems. And uh, in other regions, it's pretty different. So I think we have to think there's no no size fits all. We have to think completely different. And that was actually your point, uh, and I really agree with that. Absolutely. Thank you. We're sadly out of time, but I do want to reiterate what both Earthrain and Barry said. This idea of, of, of acknowledging lived experience, lived knowledge, indigenous people's knowledge in particular, as well as place-based solutions is particularly important when we're talking about uh, true cost accounting, true value in our food systems, and how to, to make the, the our food systems actually work for all people, not just a, a select few. I want to thank our panelists, I want to thank our organizers, and I want to thank all of you for sticking around. Thank you so much.
Thank mm-hmm. you.